Welcome to episode seven <laughs> of the Bitcoin Show. We're continuing our conversation right now with uh, uh, Kevin Day from Chicago, Illinois, who was the um, fortunate or unfortunate, depending on how you look at it, beneficiary of uh, about five million dollars worth of Bitcoin that he sort of accidentally bought at uh, a penny a piece. And uh, we're just continuing our conversation because we're getting into so many, so many good things. One of the, the um, by the way, one of the things that I wanted to, somebody brought up in the chat room just now is they're saying, tell people don't just copy their wallet.dat file. That if you are talking about securely storing your Bitcoin on your own computer, um, we're going to do a how-to video. You don't want to just do this on any computer, especially not Windows, um, because there are viruses in the wild that will actually look for your wallet file and steal it. So uh, we're going to do a how-to video. Basically, it's going to be how to download Ubuntu onto a, uh, the ISO file and how to burn the disk, boot from the disk, and wipe out your entire computer's hard drive if you have to buy a brand new computer or take an old one or something. But use a fresh virgin computer. And we're talking about if you have any, you know, any kind of serious money, like you know, more than a month's worth of income, then it's worth it. Dedicate a computer to this. Install Ubuntu on it. Install the Bitcoin client on it. And install a, uh, uh, an encryption program like TrueCrypt. And one of the things that they're saying is don't just copy the wallet.dat file. You have to actually close the Bitcoin client first. Make sure the Bitcoin client is closed and then copy the wallet.dat file. Otherwise, you could get a broken backup is what I'm, what I'm told. So, um, <coughs> so, Kevin, you were saying that the way you got this uh, to go through is everybody, you, you were, you're watching the market, market crash. So how long did it take to go from $17 to, to a penny? It was, it was at least 20 minutes. Um, and it was a really agonizing 20 minutes, too, because you really couldn't do anything on the Mt. Gox website while it was happening, you know. I, I don't know how they really got the site programmed, but it was while a trade is, is still executing and it's still matching up buyers and sellers for one order, everything seems to be locked out and you can't do anything else. Right. So it was a very slow, you know, this is happening and no one can do anything while it's happening kind of deal. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was at least 20 minutes, if not a little bit longer than that, of just going from $17 to a penny. Wow. And then the way you beat everyone else out is you, you were just smart. Um, you, you benefited from the smart tax. You, you, so you bid 0 0.0101? Right. Um, I bid one cent and one one hundredth of a cent <laughs> for the Bitcoins because everybody else had buy orders at exactly one penny. Nobody had one slightly above a penny. So I saw that was happening, placed mine just the tiniest bit above the existing orders and just through dumb luck happened to get mine in and that executed, you know. Right. What do you, I mean, people talk about a, um, a stopgap or what do you call it, like a, uh, some sort of a, uh, an automated system that if the market, s if, if the system sees the market crashing suddenly that it could put the brakes on, uh, how would something like that work? Do you have any idea? Um, well, I know it in you know current stock exchanges, if, if a stock drops below a certain percentage during the day, trading's halted for a certain amount of time, and then if it continues to drop, it's halted again, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, just to give people a breather so that clear heads are making decisions, people aren't making panics, which is what I think a lot of people were trying to do. I saw on IRC people screaming that they were trying to sell at $3, and it wasn't taking their bid. And wow. I think they probably would have been glad afterwards that that wasn't happening, you know? So whether the delays of accepting orders was an intentional stroke of genius or just a limitation of the system, I don't know. But I think that allowed some people at least to think about things before mm -hmm. they were allowed to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And then what really I think gave me the most faith in the economy was how quickly it rebounded. You know, it hit zero. I mean, the, this, the, the price was, was nothing and rebounded to $12 in a matter of minutes. Right. And there actually was a decent volume of people going, you know, there's, there's no reason for the price to be this low. It really does have an intrinsic value of more than $10. Right. The, uh, so, yeah, I think that's a good idea. So as long as it's published uh, clearly in advance that uh, there's a break system that if the market falls more than some percent, I don't know what, 20% uh, within a certain number of hours or minutes or something that it just freezes all trading. <clears throat> just to take a breather. I think that's a really right. smart idea. Um, all the exchange sites might want to investigate that. One of the things that would make that difficult would be that, you know, when you're buying, say, shares of Ford on, on the stock exchange right now, there's only one exchange that sells that. 
here we have multiple exchanges selling basically the same product. So if one of them were to halt trading and another one didn't, it may give people some advantages to be able to gain the system even further. It would have to be one of those, all the beta exchanges I think would really have to agree on doing it the rules. Wow, which yeah. is sort of a, a centralized thing that I don't know if the Bitcoin community really is in favor of. Right. Well, I think it, for the benefit of the entire Bitcoin community, it sounds, you know, as long as the rules are the same, I think that, right. uh, and they're published that way and they're followed. If the rules are published, I would have no problem with it. You right. know? Yeah. I think it does make sense. What do you guys in the chat room think? And while I'm asking you that, I want to quickly say uh, this episode of uh, The Bitcoin Show is brought to you by Ambivert Creative. A-M-B-I-V-E-R-T, ambivertcreative.com. We create, they create your corporate logo, identity, website, print, everything. They create your identity for you, for your business. And bitcoinbonus.com. All your online shopping that you're doing anyway, you get paid back with Bitcoins. It's brilliant. Check it out, bitcoinbonus.com. Also, bluecanarynightlight.com. Bluecanarynightlight.com. Buy a blue canary light nightlight <laughs> with your Bitcoin. All of, these, all of these merchants accept Bitcoin, of course. And tradehill.com. Tradehill.com, of course. The uh, new automated exchange site, 24 hours a day, making it super, super easy to get all your money in and out. Make sure you get 10% off your trades for life by using the referral code that is THR, I'm sorry, TH-R141, TH-R141. Thanks to our sponsors for allowing us to be here today. Okay, so uh, let's see, what, let's see what questions we have in the chat room, if there are any coming up here. Um, so, To, um, I guess if you were, uh, if Mark was sitting right here, <laughs> what would you say to him? First, that I'm really sorry this has happened um, because I don't think anyone is coming out ahead from this. You know, I don't think the hacks got away with anywhere near as much as they were hoping to, if anything. I, and I think this is going to really shake up the whole market for a long time. So, you know, if anything, I would want Mark to know that I want to help resolve this as, as quickly as possible, you know, mm -hmm. and hope that he would believe that. Um, what I would suggest him to do, I don't know. I, I definitely think they need to find a middle ground from what they're proposing and what I would like. Um, I, I, I think they need to take some responsibility for what happened, and right now it seems like they're, they're saying the only responsibility they have is to try to undo this. Right. And I'm not sure that's really the best response. You know, um, I think that just, it sets so many dangerous precedents. <laughs> Do you suppose, suppose I made a giant sale one day, and the next day I decided it was a mistake. Can I now claim my account got hacked and ask him to re undo it? Mm -hmm. You know, and has he really thought these things through? You know, there, there's a reason why rollbacks, um, major exchanges are so limited and so well defined, so that people can't game it. You know, mm -hmm. is, is he implying now by doing this that he's basically ensuring every account is held with him? You know, mm -hmm. is that part of what we're paying our, our trade fees for? Because it looks like that's what he's doing with this account. You know, if, if he is actually trying to say he's going to ensure these losses, can we all rely on that? Mm -hmm. You know, th those right. are the kind of questions I would like to get from him before trading reopens. Because if he reopens trading with so much uncertainty, I can't imagine it going anywhere but far, far down. Right. Do you believe what uh, the, their story that the uh, that it was a financial auditor and uh, that had read only access to the database and all that? I mean, does does it does it add up to you this story? That part sounds plausible, but sloppy. You know, um, I I think when you're dealing with financial instruments like this, you need to be a lot more careful. You need to treat this like you know. One of the things in my day job I deal with is, is credit card processing and the amount of security we have to go through to be able to handle holding a credit card number for a microsecond far exceeds what it looks like a lot of these exchanges are doing. And I think maybe some lessons to be learned there by looking at how they handle security in, in terms of merchants. Um, that part of the story I think is completely plausible. What, what I, I, I question is some of the other elements of the story though of who is this person for one and how did he get Mark's attention so quickly? You know, um, one of the things that Mark was saying was that you know a police report had been filed within less than an hour of 
when all this went down and mm. he was involved in all this and all, you know how did all these things happen if there wasn't some existing relationship between these two mm-hmm. and if there was an existing relationship why isn't that being made open right now you know is this an investor is this a friend is this, you know i know those are kind of wild accusations but if he doesn't answer these questions it, it leads to the more questions right Someone uh, is tweeting to me saying, uh, someone's offering Trade Hill Bitcoin user password hashes now. I don't know if that's true. Who knows? You get all kinds of uh, crazy stories that are unverified, but, you know, that's the Internet. <laughs> um, the advantage is if, if people are doing what you say and using passwords of that magnitude, even if it's encrypted, it doesn't no good. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't do the attacker any good, you know? Right. It, if, if your password is, basically the only way that people can break encrypted passwords is just trying lots of passwords and seeing which one ends up with the same encryption as the one in the, the file they've obtained. Mm-hmm. So unless they happen to guess your 16 character random password, they're safe. So anybody who's following advice like you and what other people have been saying over these past couple days is safe even if, even if the database has gotten out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as long as it's, yeah, exactly. As long as it's long and, and, and uh, uh, long and unique and so on, strong. The, uh, they're reminding us that in the new version of the Bitcoin client, the uh, wallet file will be encrypted by default, which is a very good thing. You still have to be cr- concerned about um, key loggers, they call a Trojan keyboard capture virus or Trojan um, that can log all your keystrokes. You can't really defend against that. So um, that's why if you have any significant amount of money here in Bitcoin, you really want to use a brand new virgin computer to back it up. And like I say, we're going to be doing this training video, a full production uh, tutorial where we do it partly screencast, partly looking over our shoulder, how you take an old, a br- you know, an old machine that's dusty in your closet or a brand new one you go out and buy, and basically how you install a, a fresh, clean version of Ubuntu Linux on it, install the, the Bitcoin client on it, and uh, some encryption software called TrueCrypt, and uh, create a your wallet.dat file, uh, put it into the TrueCrypt volume, uh, copy your address out of it, and then close the whole thing, uh, back up the encrypted version to you know maybe you know, four or five or half a dozen uh, virgin thumb drives that you bought, maybe even burn them to a CD. And then when you're finished, uh, you, of course you save the Bitcoin address, and uh, then you completely wipe the computer securely clean and reinstall the operating system and you're good to go. And that way you have a Bitcoin address that is only uh, accessible to spend. It's like a piggy bank, deposit only. You can take this Bitcoin address and uh, whenever, basically use your mybitcoin.com or whatever you want to use as your you know, coffee money, pocket change. And whenever you want to put money in your savings account, you just send it to that Bitcoin address. And that's your secure Bitcoin address that uh, is only available on those thumb drives. And even if somebody gets the thumb drive, which of course you hide in multiple different places and so on, if, it, if somebody gets a hold of one, they still can't use it because it's encrypted with a strong, secure password. So we're going to teach people how to do that. And um, obviously, with, a, with doing it this way, you're, you're sure there's not going to be any viruses and you're not going to connect to the Internet for any other purpose than to, to get the Bitcoin client and the uh, encryption software and nothing else and so on. So if you follow the instructions precisely, you'll basically have a piggy bank deposit-only address that you can send Bitcoins to and those never have to be online, but you can still check your balance anytime you want with the, um, what is it called, Block Explorer. So we're going to teach people how to do that. It'll probably be like a 20-minute video, but it'll be worth it because, um, you know, this is what people need. They really, really need a way to secure their Bitcoins themselves, offline, secured, encrypted. Um, if, it, if they back it up to the Internet, to the cloud somewhere, this file, uh, securely, then they could actually just, you know, go anywhere without taking anything with them as long as they can get to the Internet and they remember their password, their Bitcoins will be safe. Would you agree with that strategy, Kevin? Definitely. Um, and that's pretty much what I did something similar with, you know, in, had this trade gone through, I would have basically done exactly what you had said there, too. You know, had I actually withdrawn all this stuff, I would have taken everything you had probably bust up a step further. But um, <laughs> what you're talking about is exactly, I think, good behavior for anyone to do something like this. Yeah. It's, um, you know, you need to treat your Bitcoin wallet like it is exposed to cash hanging out of your pocket. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think if anything, maybe the communities failed newcomers at expressing how important that is. 
So, you know, I think like what you're doing here to, to educate people about this is, is really important because every time someone gets burned and loses money, that just makes it that much harder for us to convince people that this is a real economy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. There, uh, someone's posting in the uh, uh, BBIT in the chat room that uh, Trade Hill is back up now, which is news, uh, breaking news as we speak. Uh, they say, uh, I'm trusting BBIT, this is accurate. He is saying, oh, it's scrolling, scrolling, hold on. Ah, scrolled right off my screen. Anyway, Trade Hill is back up, and they're saying that there, there have been a lot of hacking attempts to uh, get in with, uh, obviously, with uh, Mt. Gox IDs and passwords and so on. So anybody that had a matching address, they've kind of forced a password reset for security, obviously. They're just taking precautionary measures to... Um, make sure everyone's safe and secure. Um, obviously, I think they're learning a lot from all this too. Um, so, let's see, uh, uh, what is this? The antithesis of the ideal of Bitcoin. Ask Kevin if he thinks a rollback is antithesis to the ideal of Bitcoin. I think it goes against the spirit of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I. Whether it was a correct assumption or not, I think a lot of people, myself included, assumed that the exchanges like this were operating under the same irreversible principles that Bitcoin themselves do. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if, if that's not the case, we need to document that better as a community. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think there, there probably has to be a middle ground. I, I don't think it can be totally Wild West, and I don't think it can be totally regulated to the level of NASDAQ, um, but if, you know, it's a slippery slope, it really is, because everyone goes, well, this regulation would have prevented this problem, and this regulation would have prevented this problem. If we keep doing it along that point, we're going to have the same regulations as the NASDAQ. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's the thing about, you know, it's, 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 it reminds me of net neutrality. Everybody wants ne net neutrality. It's a wonderful thing, and we all... I, it's, it's an ideal that it's all a level playing field. It's the way it's been and it, the way it should be and all that. But do we want the government to enforce it? That's a whole other story. Right. Because it's, you know, as soon as you start demanding that the government enforce it, you're actually demanding to give away your freedom to the government because they're going to enforce it. They're going to enforce all kinds of other stuff that they decide to throw in there. Right. And you know, in this specific case too, I probably would feel more comfortable not having the market attempt to be the police in this. Mm -hmm. And letting us go through the proper, you know, law enforcement channels to resolve this, because I don't know that they're necessarily making decisions that are backed in law. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm trying to get away with something I shouldn't, but mm -hmm. I also don't know if I feel comfortable with a kind of barely related third party to this deciding who's right and wrong and something. Right. Like this. Yeah, because you pointed out, I think that. On this, the, the, one of the very few things that Mt. Gox does document on their site is that they will uh, never be a party to a transaction, right? They're just matching right. buyers and sellers. And isn't it true that if they are taking it upon themselves to roll back or decide when a rollback is necessary and how far to roll back, they roll back one transaction too far or whatever, then, you know, aren't they a party to a transaction, which is exactly the opposite of what they're promising? Right. And I, I've been getting a major amount of exchange education over the last couple days here. And one of the things I was told was there is a legal term called being a counterparty to a trade, um, mm -hmm. which has specific meanings legally. Um, mm -hmm. And usually, say like a stockbroker says they would become a, a counterparty to this trade, which means they're accepting some of the responsibility for if it goes wrong and they're sort of vouching for the authenticity of it and all this sort of thing here, where Mt. Gox specifically used the words, and let me make sure I get this right, um, you are trading with other users of Mt. Gox. Mt. Gox does not act as a counterparty to any trade. And legally what that means is they're washing their hands of everything that happens and are just acting like a matchmaker. You know, some exchanges work where they're actually, you know, the money goes through them and they, they handle every bit of it along the way some of them just work as being almost over the counter where here's a buyer, here's a seller, it's up to you guys to make things happen. And if that's what Mt. Gox was, was telling people they were doing, they're really overstepping their authority by performing a rollback. Right. And that, this gets into some legal things that I, I don't claim to understand because this is getting to some of the really in-depth market um, 
market law that I, I, I'm not a lawyer, but right. the lawyers that have been talking to me said that they probably made a mistake using those exact words, you know, where if this went through court that was, you know, well-educated in market law, them claiming we are not a counterparty to any trade means they do not have any authority to touch anything then. You know, that they told us that they did not have the authority to touch something. Mm -hmm. And that that alone right there is one of the reasons why the lawyers who have been talking to me are telling me that this would be a surprisingly high chance of winning if I was going to go pursue this. Mm -hmm. what, some people are, su are suggesting that Mt. Gox or the, any exchange sites should have insurance. What do you think about that? Well, I, I think what's almost happening right now is that they are implicitly saying they are insuring accounts. You know, here's mm -hmm. an account got hacked, and he's, they're saying that they're going to do everything they can to undo this and probably make up the difference themselves. So whether they're offering it as a service or not in practice, what they're doing in this case is offering insurance. You know, mm -hmm. I, and I would just like to sort of have that formalized, that's what they're doing. You know, is this a case of they're taking the money that all of us have been contributing to them in the form of trade fees and bailing out a friend, mm -hmm. or are they making this a advertised feature that we all can rely on. You know, right. it, it can't be neither of those, though. Right. There's, I mean, this is actually reminiscent of, um, some people have been into Bitcoin for a while, remember the uh, help, Mt. Gox froze my account with something like, what was it, $45,000 or $60,000 in it or something like that. And it turned out to be, um, apparently, someone had, again, hacked into someone's um, insecure password and hacked their you know, with a brute force attack, got into their Mt. Gox account, and then they were withdrawing $1,000 a day, and I don't know if it was over three days or six days, they got $3,000 or $6,000 out, and they were able to track that through the, through the um, Block Explorer and, and track those uh, transactions and where they went and kind of forensically routed it back, and they actually got a connection back to another Mt. Gox account that had deposited some money, and then uh, there, shortly thereafter, someone deposited some amount, I forget, chat room, you can help me, but maybe like, say $45,000 or something like that. And at the time, I think this was when Jed was still um, running Mt. Gox, and it was like right around the transition period, uh, as I recall. And uh, they, uh, this, I mean, it was like this, this uh, huge story blew up about help, they froze my account and everyone panicked. But it was because Mt. Gox had kind of stepped in and in a sense they played police and said, no, this, is, uh, this person is involved in this crime and we're gonna, they froze their funds. And I don't actually know what happened after that, if they, if they actually did get some sort of authorities involved. And you know, in cases like this, like who are you gonna call? <laughs> Somebody in Costa Rica or Japan or the US or you know, who knows where? You know, the person could have been in London or Russia. Right, and this is, this is one of the other reasons why I'm, I'm trying to say this is a very slippery slope if they're gonna claim that they're gonna keep doing this, you know. Mm -hmm. if if they're going to play police over this, what happens if someone withdraws it to a country that has no extradition, you know? Yeah. Um, what happens if they can't prevent it? You know, are they accepting liability for that now? Right. Um, and the other thing too is, I think they're probably torn in the middle of this because they probably don't want to get involved in these sort of things because it's time consuming, there's risks of getting dragged into something that they don't want to be dragged into, and it, it could very quickly become a mess for them, but if they don't get involved in things like this, I think they're probably very worried that they're going to get some very unwanted legal attention. You know, there's going to be the FBI coming to have chats with them because someone complained that $5 million got stolen from them, you know, and mm -hmm. they don't want the air of accusations holding over everything. So mm -hmm. I think they're trying to play both sides a little bit. Right. Can you guys hear uh, Kevin's audio, as they're saying, is a little bit low? Maybe bring it up a little bit when he's talking. The, um, so you were able, some people are uh, joining us late. You were able to withdraw 600 Bitcoin, was it? I was able to withdraw 643 Bitcoins because at, at the time I placed the withdrawal, the price was right at 63 cents because of some orders that were starting to slip back in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it was not a case of, hey, quick, let me cash out while I can. It, it honestly was a case of, I have no idea what's going on. There's a good chance the whole site's been hacked. If I can at least be the one holding it, not the hacker, we stand a lot better chance of being able to fix any of this, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, we froze. <laughs> Your audio and video froze. We'll wait for Skype to catch up here. While you're mm -hmm. frozen. If I get that. Oh, wait a minute. Are you there? Can you hear us? 
Yep, I'm, I'm still here. Okay, so to, your video yeah, froze, but that's okay. It'll come back up. And um, look, I'm sorry to interrupt because you froze anyway. But let me tell you this: somebody's popping in the chat room telling me City City Group hacker uh, affected more customers than first thought. Citibank and City Group was uh, hacked recently too. It's not just Mt. Gox. This is happening in, in all kinds of financial institutions. You know, we know about Sony, and it's becoming famous. These uh, hackers are getting more and more tricky. And uh, Bitcoin is a is a you know a, a fetus of a, of an industry, and we're but it's 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 come of age. So it's really really quickly come of age. Obviously, um, people are now you know who had only pennies and dollars in it are now um, wealthy. Some people are very very wealthy from it or whatever. There's a lot of money in it and a lot of capital in it. So it's t you know that we have to grow up. These in institutions have to grow up, and, and we're playing with the, in the big leagues now. So they've got to secure it. And if, if Citibank is having trouble doing that, you know, it's. Uh, I guess that should make Mt. Gox feel better. <laughs> they're they're not alone. Yeah. Security is hard. You know, one of my day jobs is handling very large websites that move a lot of money and. It's what keeps me up at night too. You know, you can be perfect writing your code 99.99% of the time, but if you've made that one little mistake that lets somebody in, the whole deal's off. Right. And, you know, especially if they're dealing with unexpected growth that's making them have to spend all their time just making the site stay running because there's so many people flooding it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, dealing with media interest and just handling their own growth, you don't have a lot of time to be going back and doing all those things that you said you were going to do once it mattered. Right, exactly. It, it's now or never. Right. Um, and I, I think that there are a lot of, um, you know, it's like anything with technology, there are a lot of security experts who um, claim to be security experts, but they're, it's all relative. Um, it's really a whole nother, a whole nother ball game, the, the league of these hackers that are coming out of Russia and who knows where, China and all that. You just never know. <laughs> I mean, it's probably just a cat and mouse game constantly uh, trying to keep up with the, the latest ways to, um, to break in. And the, the public obviously isn't aware of the complexity of it. They're just clueless. All they know is I had my money in Mt. Gox and I trusted them. And so what do you think that this is going to do to the reputation of Mt. Gox, this incident? I, I really think it's going to come down to how much they're willing to spend to make the problem go away. Um, if they are covering themselves first, which is what, to some, this is myself included, what it looks like they're doing, it makes it really hard for the, us to think that it's, they're, they're looking after the future, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so how they handle the next 24 hours, I think, is going to dramatically change how the future of their business works. Um, you know, who decides it's going to take a loss on this is really going to dictate everything to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's adding uncertainty and you know the market never likes uncertainty. Is there a certain dollar amount or Bitcoin amount that um, Mt. Gox could offer to you for your inconvenience that you would be happy with? And I, I'm honestly trying not to look at it that way. Um, you know, it, it's one of those, I'm, I'm more concerned with the moral aspect of it than the financial as much as my wife would kill me for saying that. <laughs> um, it's I don't know. You know, mm -hmm. it's one of those I, I, I've tried to weigh the pros and cons of anything I possibly do, and it's really hard to cope with a scenario that does not ruin things for everybody. You know, yeah. Yeah. And I even was sort of you know half fantasizing when I thought you know suppose I did get at least five million dollars worth of bitcoins, I could never spend that. You know, if I tried to sell all that in any reasonable amount of time, I'd crash the market just again. Yeah. So it. Really well, you could hold on to it for a year or two, and everything would be changed by then. Right, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm so, sure you thought of that. Um, it's it's hard to say, really. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's the the whole economy is is very fragile in some places, and how one person can have such a dramatic effect over the entire market is is frightening to, to some people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, how how they're going to, to deal with this is really going to be very interesting. Um, if if their response is to take any kind of responsibility for this and say, you know, we will cover X, Y, and Z, the rest we just simply can't afford to, I think people would have a tough time saying they're still the bad guys in this. Right. Where at the total opposite end of the spectrum, you know, suppose this does come out one day that 
whoever was storing five hundred thousand dollars was an employee of the company or, or whatever. You know, there, there's there's a probably a very good reason why whoever owns this account has not stepped forward yet. Mm -hmm. You know, suppose it is something potentially embarrassing to them, and they made no effort to try to appease every party involved. They did not go after the auditor to try to get some kind of insurance payout for this. Whatever. It becomes very much an us versus them market. Then you know mm -hmm. they're they're right. definitely not on the side of the community anymore. Right. Do you think that uh, there's there's a certain amount of responsibility that lies on the on the customer on the Mount Gox customer, all of the customers, all of us who are putting all of our eggs in one basket, where 90% of all the trades are happening on one exchange. I mean, I know there weren't options really. There were no other choices until recently, um, but everybody relied on Mount Gox and maybe too much so, and Mount Gox wasn't prepared to handle the, the volume and the security and the growth. And I mean, I, w people said in the forum I was reading that um, you can look at, obviously everyone now can look at the uh, user list some 60 some thousand uh, names and so on and that it doubled in the last few weeks or something like that the, the growth has been so so fast it mm -hmm. might have overwhelmed them as far as the growth the number of transactions the volume all of that it, I mean people the only thing people notice is look at the volume look at how much money they're making that's all they know it's like wow they're making so much money they should be able to handle this yeah that's easy to say if you've got all the money to begin with but they didn't have that money <laughs> that just yeah. just suddenly happened and boom one guy now build the infrastructure infrastructure that's going to rival Citibank no and and that's that's a really good point you know um i don't think just because they've made a small fortune off this that they are they are suddenly that alone makes them responsible for what happened which i know some people are saying is that you know they've made you know 1.2% basically off of everyone every trade going through that alone has made them very wealthy, you know, yeah. um, but they're probably also in the same situation where they cannot sell large amounts of it without substantially affecting the market, mm -hmm. so they would probably be in the same situation. Um, but at the same time, the fact that they are able to make things right at least gives them some more options than the one they're presenting right now. You know, if it were really a case that this were a completely non-profit, we charge no fee, but, you know, it's all just us doing our best effort kind of deal, like the way a lot of the mining pools work. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone will be going, hey, you're responsible for what happened, you know, you have to do this. The, the fact that they have been making this a commercial service and we've all, everyone who's used Mapgox has paid into their infrastructure for this system, I think does make it harder for them to claim they have no responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, we're customers now, not just the community that's all benefiting off of each other. You know, they definitely made it a, you are a customer of ours relationship. Right. What do you think this is going to do to the price of Bitcoin in the immediate future, like now, today, tomorrow, this week, and in the long term, six months from now? Um, I, I think the uncertainty alone of all of this, even for anything I've mentioned in this, you know, just the uncertainty of what's happened is probably going to drive prices down for a while just because, you know, no investor likes the uncertainty. They, they try to, I think we all look at what the worst case could be, what the best case could be, and try to aim in the middle. And every time the worst case gets further and further down, our average goes with that. And people price that into to what they're willing to spend. So I think, you know, I, I don't think this is going to destroy the economy, especially if everybody involved in this works together. You know, I think everybody involved here, though, also has a chance to destroy the economy if they wanted to. You know, if Mt. Gox were to run off with everyone's money, that would be disastrous. You know, right. if um, the legitimate owner of this, this money decided, you know what, I like what happened when that did that, I'm going to do that again, that would be another humongous blow to the economy. Right. You know, um, I think if I lawyered up, got injunctions placed, and cast this huge doubt over if people could ever withdraw their money from Mount Gox or not, that would be the end of them as well. And so right. I think as long as we're all playing together going, you know, this is a really bizarre situation, let's get past it. I don't think there's going to be a long-term effect by this. I think we're going to look back at this and go, well, oh my God, what just happened, you know? Right. But it's not going to be the defining moment of Bitcoin. Right. And I mean, as long as we all work together. Exactly. You know? is, that, is, that what is that your message, that you, you want to work together for the betterment of Bitcoin and get past this? Definitely. You know, I mean, I, 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 I would hope people seeing the action, I mean, I know you're taking my word for this, but that the actions I have placed so far kind of show that I'm not after a quick buck for this. You know, I could have screwed over the whole economy and didn't. 
-hmm. You know, I could have had all these in my wallet right now, and Mark would be coming to me asking for them back. You know. Right. Um, so I, I think you know, I'm trying to show everybody my motives are are at least good. Um, Let me repeat that. I'm sorry to interrupt. Let me repeat that. That <clears throat> what um, uh, what you're what Kevin is saying is that he had the ability to withdraw uh, these Bitcoin, but he didn't. You know, he could have actually withdrawn the Bitcoin, but he didn't do it. He actually um, thought if he did, that would, you know, that would, could um, shed uh, suspicion that he was actually involved in this thing, because he saw the thing happening. He saw the whole thing happening. And, you know, he, he went with it and he bought the Bitcoin, you know, who wouldn't? I mean, you're, you're, that's the whole point of being there is to buy Bitcoin. So he did it. And um, but let me ask you this, though. Did, did you realize that did you think this was a natural market crash or did you think that did you have a suspicion that this was a, a fraudulent thing? Well, my, my first reaction to this actually was that, you know, there had been talk of people who own large botnets, you know, basically tens of thousands of computers that they have infected with some virus. There's been rumors that somebody has been infecting, you know, 50,000 computers and made them all mine bitcoins without their owner's knowledge. Right. And there was, I had always sort of been just waiting for the moment that whoever did that tried to cash out. Because I think they're, gonna have, they're really only going to have one chance of doing that. Ah. And that was what I originally thought was happening was this was someone just trying to cash out a lot of ill-gotten gains. Just dumping it fast, right. yeah. Yeah. And... That, that honestly was what I thought happened until it hit a penny, you know, and I thought even somebody this stupid would not do that, you know. Right. I don't care how much of a criminal mind you have and how much of a, a sociopath you are, you could have made more money by not doing that, right. you know. Right. So then I, I was really trying to think of what someone would gain from making things hit a penny, and when I hit the thousand dollar limit, that is instantly what I realized that they were doing as well, was they probably were trying to cash out mm -hmm. by making things crash. Right. And that was why I did not want to do the same thing, because how would that be distinguishable from what the attacker was attempting to accomplish? Exactly. Then you really look like the, the attacker, uh, right. the hacker. So, <clears throat> all right. Um, I forgot my question now. <laughs> but, but the point I wanted to make is that, uh, you know, Kevin contacted me, uh, you know, in the chat last night, right after the show aired with uh, the guys from Mt. Gox and said, look, um, here's the rest of the story. Um, it's not being fully disclosed. Uh, it made it look like the hacker actually uh, sold the Bitcoins to himself and another accountant. And actually what happened is he was the one who purchased it, you know, sort of randomly and accidentally, of course. He wasn't involved in the hacking at all. Uh, he could have withdrawn the money from Mt. Gox right on the spot. He could have done it. He could have gotten away with it. And um, even though he wasn't involved in the hacking and he did a legitimate trade, he would have had the money on his computer <laughs> and his wallet, that, that. And then Mt. Gox would be coming after him and saying, please, please, please give us our $5 million worth of Bitcoin back. And then the right. whole, this whole, it'd be a very different story. It actually probably would be the end of Mt. Gox. Um, I don't know, unless they want to go to a, a reserve bank, uh, a, you know, a fractional reserve system and, uh, and be in debt to their own system for that much. But uh, <clears throat> the, you know, that would have changed the whole story. It probably would have shed a lot of doubt on you, Kevin, that you, know, mm -hmm. that you were, you know, ob people would jump to conclusions. You know that. That's why you're smart to, to not do that because people would immediately say, yeah, 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 that's too suspicious. This, this is no coincidence. He's followed the money and all that common sense, quote unquote. Um, it, would, it would, you know, at least, Circumstantially, it would look really bad for you, but obviously you didn't do that. Obviously, you're innocent. You wouldn't be coming forward and talking on, on television about this if you were the hacker. What would the point of that be? So, um, yeah. mm -hmm. um, one of the other points I, I was really hoping to make by coming out in public from this was that right or wrong, and, and I'm not claiming any malicious intent whatsoever, is that the Mount Gox people seem to be implying that the whole reason behind this rollback they want to do is that the hacker is the one who, who bought all these coins and they have to undo that, otherwise he's going to benefit. And I see people repeating that line as well. Mm -hmm. And the well, I'm not saying I'm more deserving than somebody else is, just that if we're going to have this discussion, let's at least have the facts correct before right. anyone is in support or against support of doing something, you know. Right. And if, to be honest, the way that it's phrased on the website, you know, I, I mean this in the 
utmost respect, I only know one language. I know English is not Mark's first language, and it is very ambiguous which way it means. But, you know, the other night I was in one of the chat rooms. I said, hey, look at this line right here. What does that mean to you? Do you read from this that the person who perpetrated this is the one who's going to benefit unless the rollback happens? And it was unanimous. Everybody thought that's what it meant. Mm -hmm. So I, I really pushed Mark to try to at least reword that. Because for one, I was telling people I'm the one who has all these bitcoins. He was telling people the hacker is the one who has all these bitcoins. People were putting those two together saying, Kevin is the one who hacked the site then. Right, yeah, it's, it's misleading. I was fighting an argument that didn't even make sense, you know. So right. I'm trying to clear the situation right now, at least say, you know, before you come out saying Mt. Gox you have to do a rollback, understand who's involved. You know, And it's not just me either. You know, I got less than half the bitcoins that, that were bought up. Um, mm. There are, uh, it's, it's impossible to tell which accounts bought, you know, was it one account that made 10 buys or 10 accounts that bought one buy, but there were hundreds of other buys that were coming in. You know, there was otherwise no way these other these bitcoins were going to sell. Somebody was buying them. Right. You know, all these people who bought some at, at various prices all did so in good faith, you know. Mm -hmm. So before all of that gets rolled back, let's at least have the story straight. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm all about full disclosure and giving people as much information as possible. I'm an advocate of free open source software and everything, all that. And transparency, and that's, that's the whole idea behind Bitcoin, the Bitcoin, uh, you know, the, the ledger is public and um, pseudonymous or whatever, but the idea of transparency, especially in an institution that you're trusting your money with. So I think that it really is important that, um, that nothing be misleading intentionally or unintentionally. So um, I think it's really important that uh, people understand the hacker did not benefit um, if he did apparently only $1,000 worth. Um, Kevin was the beneficiary of all this vast amount of Bitcoin, and, but he didn't actually get it. It's in, it's in his, uh, you know, Mt. Gox account, which is locked up like everyone else's. And um, if a rollback happens, he, he won't have uh, received anything except for the 600 Bitcoin that you withdrew at that moment, but, but not, right. the, not the vast majority of it. So... Um, you know, someone says <laughs> Kevin's uh, employing reverse psychology, that he's really the hacker and, uh, and he's uh, coming out because then uh, everyone will think he's not, which is such, so ridiculous because obviously, you, you know, <laughs> he didn't benefit anyway. So, um, you know, that would probably be pretty stupid. I, I have a feeling we'll, ne we'll probably never know who did that because they have no incentive to come forward now. They can't brag about it because they, as far as we can tell, they failed, yeah. you know. All yeah. they did was cause some trouble, and the people who were in it to cause trouble would have been bragging about us already. So exactly. I think this was an opportunist who was trying to make a quick buck, didn't, and mm -hmm. giving away his identity now is going to do nothing, you know? Right. Right. Okay. Well, um, a lot of questions and uh, a lot of concerns. Uh, I'm glad we... Uh, oh, oh, I, one more thing. There, there was a uh, major transfer that happened right around the time of this crash, right? Have you been reading right. about that? Um, was it 300,000 Bitcoin or something like that? And uh, yeah. what do you, what's your take on that? Mt. Gox says that it was a routine transfer to transfer their Bitcoin out of a, one of their wallets to take it offline. What do you think, is that related to this crash? I think it was probably, you know, if what they're saying is true, it's probably a very prudent thing for them to do. You know, if, mm -hmm. if possibly their entire system has been compromised, at the very least they need to move, they need to treat their wallet as compromised and move all the money to a different wallet or they risk losing everything. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of concerns me though is if that is all of their money, that's far less than I think a lot of people assume they have in holdings right now, you know, mm -hmm. which I think is maybe the bigger story here. Do they only have 400,000 bitcoins? You know, was one person holding, you know, so this one person here had more than 500,000. Did mm -hmm. this one person hold more than half of their inventory? And is that why they're so desperate to have it back at the moment? You know, mm -hmm. if, if 400,000 is all they have, they are very uncapitalized compared to, I think, what a lot of people's expectations are. Well, couldn't yeah. they have just been creaming off the excess? Like, uh, with all the growth and all these new deposits, they were just, t every once in a while, they're peeling off the excess to keep it uh, within, you know, a, a, a reasonable percentage. That, and that, that is possibly, you know, that is conceivable too, but I, I guess if I were in their shoes, I would treat everything as compromised, you know. Even if I had the, the other wallets that other things were in stored on flash drives that weren't plugged in, how do I know that when I was doing that, that computer wasn't compromised, you know. The prudent thing would have to be to treat every Bitcoin they have 
as potentially compromised and move them all to new wallets. And that was the only large transaction that's happened in this time frame. So, you know, again, I, this is really speculation. This is reading a lot into something that we're only seeing a single number here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they took credit for that transaction saying they were moving their money to somewhere safer. My question in response is, is that all you have right now? You know, yeah. so that, that really changes this whole story then. Yeah. What do you think somebody, about... Somebody potentially just walk off with 60% of their, of, their, of their deposits. Yeah, that would change everything, wouldn't it? What do you think about transparency in exchange sites? Should the should these exchange sites uh, publicly disclose all their holdings and where they are and, you know, wide open glass house transparency? I think people now are going to demand that, you know, or at the very least start asking for more of it. You mm -hmm. know, um, all we have right now is faith that they have not overspent what people have deposited in them. You know, right. if this causes a run in things when it reopens, we're, we're probably going to find out. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm Really, I, I don't think that's true. I really don't. You know, mm -hmm. um, I I'm really under the assumption that they have been honest with us. You know, and that they have not gone into a secret fractional reserve. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're we're obviously trusting um, everybody that everybody that we have our our bitcoins in in the cloud. The um, <clears throat> but obviously, you know, it's a whole different game when you trust someone. You trust someone with five bucks. You trust somebody with ten bucks. You trust somebody with a hundred bucks, thousand bucks, ten thousand bucks million bucks is a whole other story you're a whole a whole different league and this you know bitcoin has doubled so many times <laughs> people mm -hmm. who just had little play money and pocket money in there suddenly have the majority of their net worth in it so it's it's just happened in what i call internet time internet speed it's just happened so fast it's caught everybody off guard like whoa wait a minute you know i talked to some uh, one of the hackathon guys who started mining like way way back many months ago and he turned on his computer and immediately made, you know, 200 Bitcoin, and then he, he shut it down and said, oh, that's silly, and he went and did something else. And now, and then later, he discovered how much a Bitcoin is worth, and he's like, whoa, where is that old computer? Let me find this Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, it, it was just, it was absolutely trivia. It was like two bucks or something, uh, or whatever. And then, um, maybe it was 20 bucks. And then he, uh, and now it's really worth some serious money. So he's like, whoa, I could actually buy a whole new system with that. But obviously, everyone in Bitcoin who's been involved for more than a month uh, or so has uh, experienced that. It's no longer play money. Right. And I think it's been a, a growing experience for everybody. This went from play money, you know, and, you know, what I think is really funny, is that, and a lot of people don't know this, is Mt. Gox stands for, you know, the, the word Mt. Gox is Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. It used to be a trading site for Magic the Gathering playing cards. And what is that? That's, a, that's an online game? Yeah, it, well, it's, no, it's, a, it's a card game. Like, it's sort of like you know, a role-playing Dungeons & Dragons sort of game, but mm -hmm. with cards. Mm -hmm. That's what Mount Gox used to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have nothing against that. But you know, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars here stored on a site that not too many months ago, the <laughs> limit of what they did was selling cards. You know, yeah, game cards. It, it was like the eBay for, for this card game. And wow. you know, that's how quickly all this grew up around it. And it's... You know, it's sort of a culture shock to everybody. Suddenly, people with resources and money and everything else are are all involved. And you know, do we suddenly grow up and, and, and play like adults, or do we still keep this the way we had it before and it's the wild west? Right. Exactly. Uh, everything is changing so so fast. All right. Well, <clears throat> I think we're out of time. Again, I can't believe it. We could just talk forever about Bitcoin, and the, there's a never-ending conversation. We may have you on again, and I'll. Uh, uh, you know, we'll be in touch and um, we'll, you know, hash it out at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, which is 2 a.m. GMT tonight. Um, that's uh, 10 p.m. here, 7 p.m. in California uh, and uh, 2 a.m. GMT. Watch us live again and we're going to have Mark um, from the owner of Mt. Gox on live with us and uh, get all your questions prepared. Write them up and get ready to put them in the chat room and we're going to ask Mark. Uh, live about all of these details and I'm sure we ha everybody has a lot of questions and uh, we'll be interested to see what he has to say about all of this and um, maybe we'll have you on again uh, soon Kevin and see how this all ha hashes out once the uh, so to speak once the dust settles. Eat your audience to see how this turns out. Yeah exactly. Okay thanks for joining us everybody and until 10 p.m. we'll see you then. Oh, of course.